Okay, I'm ready to start up again. Just before lunch, I had given a um, fairly in-depth overview of the Darwin core terms, the philosophy behind them, and ways to extend beyond what is readily apparent in those terms by using the dynamic properties to basically load any other kind of information that you want. And now I'm going to talk about another way to extend Darwin core, which is using something called uh, GBIF extension. Uh, and then for the rest of the afternoon, what I'll do is talk about Darwin core archives, a specific way of sharing data in Darwin core format. And then I'll begin with a, an exercising in mapping data from an original data set to Darwin core to show you what that looks like, and then we'll go into exercises and doing that same thing for your, um, on a data set that I've given you on the pen drive to map a data set to Darwin Core. And then we'll do some exploring of the GBIF data, which you'll be able to do after I've given a portal demonstration. Uh, and then finally, uh, if you have data already, a database of your own, Another exercise would be to try to use your data set and map it against Darwin Core and see if there are any challenges in doing so and ask questions about how you would do something that is an apparent challenge. Okay. <clears throat> Darwin Core can be extended in a way that I described before our break by adding data sets that expand upon a specimen or observation record. Data sets like um, media or identifications. What I'm showing here is a page from GBIF's registry showing a series of different kinds of extensions to the Darwin core that are already in existence. And the extensions may be made entirely of Darwin Core terms, or they might be <coughs> constructed from a combination of Darwin Core terms and entirely new terms that are not in the Darwin Core, but are specific to some other community. So one of those, the very first one on the list, is an example where the genetic resources community got together and described how they need to share their data sets. And they created something called a germplasm accession extension. And in that extension, there are terms that they've created on their own to enhance what is shareable. I don't want to go into the details of that particular community's extension. What I do want to do is show you uh, an extension for media. Because I think that will be quite relevant for our course here. So that one is called the simple images extension. <clears throat> it's right here, it's listed here. You can see some of the characteristics of it. It consists of 15 other terms and <clears throat> some other details about how it can be used. But I want to go right into it and look at the details of the terms that this extension shows us, if I can connect. Seem to have Good luck, Yvette. <clears throat> okay, what I'd like to do here is show inside of an IPT what is it like to try to map an original data set to the Darwin core. The IPT allows you to do this. Okay, so what I'm looking at here is a particular aspect of the IPT that allows me to manage a resource. So what I'm doing is actually managing a resource I've created just for this purpose, for this course, 
in which I've already done the first step of loading the source data. The source data came from a file called CRCM Birds. It was five megabytes, had 13,000 rows with 68 columns in it. And that was done yesterday. Now what I want to do is the next step, which is to take those source data and look at the mappings to the Darwin core and see if we can match and make it look like Darwin core. So my options are only to map to a Darwin core occurrence because I've already said it was an occurrence data set. So now I want to choose the CRCM birds data source. That data file is the only one. <clears throat> and now I'm taken into a screen in which the, this IPT has made an attempt to map everything automatically. And in so doing, it has found that there was no basis of record field. And it's required to have a basis of record field so that people know what kind of record it is. The other problem was that the coordinate uncertainty in meters is mapped to values of the wrong data type. So it's smart enough to know. There was a coordinate uncertainty meter, uncoordinate uncertainty in meters in the original data file. So a Darwin core term but it doesn't have the right kind of data in it. So this is what IPT has done for me. It's tried to do as much as it can automatically and found two problems. So now let's go look specifically. So now I'm in the section of the IPT where I can map uh, the Darwin core terms to terms in the database. Down here you can see that there were none of these Dublin core record level terms were automatically mapped. So either they didn't have these data in the original or they didn't have those names in the columns. Up here, there are two other aspects. Remember I talked about the occurrence ID and that that was going to be a way to globally uniquely identify data records? It did not find an occurrence ID in the original data set. This is quite common because the original data set wasn't constructed to be a global data set. It was constructed to be a database for the bird collection at this institution called CRCM. So they don't have an occurrence ID. So we need to provide one. It's required. That's why it's in the darker reddish color. So I'm going to have to try to come up with an occurrence ID for this data set. And here are my options. These are, from here, catnum down, these are fields in the database. And then the first t three options, there's, there's an option to not have an ID, that that won't allow you to publish an archive, so it's not really an option. The second one is to create a unique identifier automatically with this data set. And that you do with a UUID generator, universal unique identifier. And then a third option is to use a line number. Truth of the matter is, none of these are good options. The truth of the matter is that this institution should come up with a way of having a global unique identifier in their own database associated with their own specimens. So when the rest of the world wants to ask about a record, they can do so with that unique identifier. Right now, they don't have one. And I'm interested in getting these data published right now. So what I'm going to do is to go to the next best thing, which is to create a unique identifier with a UUID generator. Just so I can keep going. So you create this, but the home institution doesn't necessarily know it exists. They may not pay any attention to it. That right now is definitely not in their database because this software is making it. What they could do is they could generate the UUID this way, then download their own Darwin Core archive, which has the UUID and their catalog number in it, create a UUID table, a field in their database, and for every catalog number match it to the UUID, populate their database with a UUID and then call that occurrence ID in their database. Then they're done. So what we have here is the IPT as a tool for creating unique identifiers. 
if you don't already have them. So that could work. But right now, whatever comes from here is coming from the IPT. It has nothing to do with their database. So it's not that useful. The next section, filter, has to do with if we want to use only part of the original data set. This allows us to select only part of the data set. I'm not going to really use that. But as an example, suppose that it wasn't just the CRCM bird database. What if it was the entire collections of the CRCM and I wanted to create a bird database with the IPT? but I didn't want to separate them out somewhere else. I could use the filter to select class equals AVs. Then all of the data in this data set where class equals AVs would be published and none of the others would. Okay? I can use that filter for any part of the data set that I want to, to publish only part of it if I want to. But that wasn't the big thing I wanted to get into. I wanted to get into the Darwin core term mapping. So I'm going to scroll down until I find something that actually did match and give you an idea not only of how many Darwin core terms are, but how few of them are normally populated in an original database. So we go quite a ways here, getting nothing, 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 nothing. Finally, we have one. Ah, once we get into location, we're starting to get some terms that match. We have country, state, province, county, verbatim, locality that the IPT was able to figure out that it corresponds with country, state, province, and ver county, and verbatim, locality. So it did automatic mapping as far as it was able to by the names that were in the original database. But because none of the rest of that was populated, it gives me the impression that the original database was not designed on Darwin Core to begin with, which is fine. But it means that when I come to publish it in this way, I have a little bit more work to do. Because now I'm going to have to determine which original fields correspond with these fields. So now that I've found some matches, I'll go back up to the top and start thinking about what I can publish. Okay, so here I am at the very beginning of the list of terms and I want to ask myself, because I've read the Darwin Core philosophy and documentation which tells me that I should try to publish as many Darwin Core fields as I can. Because the more Darwin Core fields I can fill, the more likely that the data set will be useful to others. Okay, so this is an aspect of data quality that I would call completeness. It's just one of the aspects of data quality, but it's one that helps people. So I ask myself, well, do I have a way to provide the information about Dublin core type? And the answer is yes. It's a specimen collection, so they are all physical objects. Now I, don't, I look through my list of fields and they have nothing in here that tells me the type. I just know this because the whole database is about specimens. So I'm given the option here to choose from the type vocabulary, one of which is physical object. You can see that there are plenty of others. These are all the legal values to use for Dublin core type. Remember before I told you there was sound, still image, moving image and physical object. Now these are physical objects. So I can select physical object here and what this means is when I publish this data set the IPT is going to put this value in for the type field for every record. Even though the original database didn't have it. Didn't have it. And I could do that for as many of these as possible. So that one was interesting because it allowed me to pick from the set of vocabulary that are standard. Now I need to go down to the ones that really are more important to the rest of the world and see, do I have any of these? 
Do I have an institution code? No, not in this database. Why? Because it's my database, and of course it's my institution. I don't need a field for it. It's the CRCM, right? So, but now I have to think globally, and I want to publish these data globally, and I need to tell people what institution it's from, so I put CRCM as a value for the institution code, and that will be saved for every record. And I'll do the same thing here for the collection code. It's the birds collection, and so on. Now, you remember there was an error at the top that said the basis of record could not be found in the original data set. And here, <coughs> it's been highlighted for us that the basis of record has a problem. <coughs> and I assure you that the data set doesn't have a field in it for basis of record. Why? Because they're all preserved specimens, of course. I don't need to say that for every record in my database. But we're sharing publicly. And not everybody necessarily knows that if it's sitting among 100 million other records. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose that it is a preserved specimen and then publish that for every record. <coughs> so I'm completing a Darwin Core record with more information than the original database had in it. And this is making it more useful when I publish it. <coughs> and I can do this for all the rest of the database. I do, however, have a catalog number in my original. And there it is at the very beginning. So this is where I'm actually making the very first mapping between the original data field and the Darwin Core data field. And these two happen to have exactly the same meaning. It's my catalog number inside of that collection, inside of that institution. So I'm going to just pick it. They're exactly the same thing. And I go on down. Occurrence remarks, turns out this is in the remarks field. I know this because I've already looked at this data set. I could guess this just by the names also, but that one's a little bit more difficult because Darwin Core actually has plenty of different remarks fields. There's an occurrence remark, a location remark, is remarks about everything. Record number. Record number is a little more difficult because it's not really that obvious to me what that means. The Darwin Core term is a little bit vague in that respect. So what I would have to do is go and read what is a record number in Darwin Core? What does that mean? <coughs> and hopefully, if I'm connected, I can get that information here directly in the IPT. If not, I go back. Oops. to the Darwin Core Quick Reference Guide and look up record number. And I find out <coughs> it's an identifier given to the occurrence at the time it was recorded. Often serves as a link between field notes and an occurrence record. And then what's missing here, the critical part, is that this is often known as a catalog or a collector's number. Okay. So that's a collect, a recorded by, or a recorded number is a collector's number. Okay, it's a shame that that's so vague in Darwin Core as a name, but there you have it. So in here, oh, I have a little problem, my first little problem. And that is, my original database actually has fields for two collectors. Not just one. So I'm faced with a choice. I can't actually create any kind of formulas in the IPT. It's not that smart. I can't say, well, <coughs> let's use collector one and add collector two with it after comma. It's not smart enough. So what are my choices? My choices are I forget collector one or collector two and just use one of them. Or I don't map it. Instead, I do something outside of the IPT to create a Darwin Core recorded by, or, or sorry, record number field myself by putting collector one and collector two together. 